From my early youth, since before I was 20, until the present time when I am over 50, I have recklessly launched out into the midst of ocean depths. I have ever bravely embarked on the open sea, throwing aside all craven caution. I have poked into every dark recess. I have made an assault on every problem. I have plunged into every abyss. I have scrutinized every creed of every sect. I have tried to lay bare the innermost doctrines of every community. All of this have I done that I might distinguish between true and false, between sound tradition and heretical innovation. this world and we leave it. That much is certain, I think. It's this road we're traveling on that we need to figure out. But then knowledge is like the horizon. It recedes as we approach it, so there is always the need to know more. From Malibu to Mecca, and now Mashhad, I've been seeking my answers from philosophy and religion, and turn to the teachings of Islam. It may not seem an obvious choice, especially if you buy into that clash of civilizations scenario. But then with so much happening in the world today, things that I've taken for granted are being called into question. How can I get to the bottom of it? Years before, I'd come across the writings of a man who'd lived nearly a thousand years ago, but whose teachings resonated within me. He exerted a tremendous influence on thinkers in the East and the West, Muslim and non-Muslim alike. His life was devoted to probing the mysteries of existence, and by overcoming his own philosophical doubts and achieving spiritual illumination, he became a model for seekers of the truth everywhere. His name was Al-Ghazali, and that's why I've embarked on this journey, to find out more about his life and his quest for ultimate reality. Al-Ghazali is generally regarded as one of the five or six most influential thinkers in the history of humanity. And his great message for posterity, and probably the main reason why he's so subsequently revered, is that he shows that at the living heart of every belief and every practice of Islam, there is a spiritual purpose and a process of repentance and upliftment and, and transformation. That's why he's called Proof of Islam. No one else quite has that title. It is here in Tus, Khorasan, in northeastern Iran, that the journey begins. This is where Ghazali was born in 1058 and would eventually return to spend the last years of his life. It seems strange that for so great a man, his final resting place should be shrouded in mystery. Everyone used to think that this was Ghazali's uh, tomb, and this mausoleum. They used to call it this, or they called it the Harun, prison of Harun. But no. why, why, why is this here? Uh, yes, this is the, just a memorial uh, stone for uh, Ghazali's tomb. Uh, for a long time, we have uh, no evidence that uh, where is Ghazal is buried really. Uh, a lot of people from everywhere, and particularly from Pakistan and Central Asia, come here and pilgrim this, this uh, stone as a Ghazali stone, but it's not real. 
There is another point that the archaeologists uh, suppose Ghazali should be buried there. And this is over the Great Wall of Tooth uh, at this time. Uh, if you like, we can have a look for uh, visit this. Here. Yes. <laughs> So you, this is where they think that Ghazali was buried? Uh, yes, uh, some evidence showed that uh, Ghazali uh, buried, has been buried here. So Ghazali was born here and then he eventually came back, but it's, it seems like a complete desolate place. Why, why would he want to come back to somewhere like this? This was a great and a huge center for, for Islamic culture. There are a lot of, a lot of scholars uh, born here in Tus, including Ghazali and... Uh, in Ghazali's day, superficially, the Islamic world was the greatest civilization that ever been. The biggest, the most prosperous, the most intellectually and architecturally productive. As a civilization, everything seemed to be flourishing. And perhaps the most productive soil in the central Islamic lands at the time was Khorasan, which approximately means the core of what we nowadays refer to as Central Asia. There were great cities there, great colleges, great disputations between theologians, also a major center for the study of Islamic law. This is where many of the early principles of Sufism were systematized and turned into a method which allowed Muslims to return as much as they could to the original spirituality at the core of the faith. So in all of those areas, Khurasan really is the heartland of Islamic intellectuality and, and, and the vibrancy of Muslim life in the period. So the Mongols laid waste to the great cities of Khurasan, erasing nearly every trace of its centers of knowledge and culture. Perhaps it's foolish looking for signs of Ghazali in the dust anyway. It was in writings like the revival of religious sciences and the alchemy of happiness that he indicated the inner meanings of the Islamic rites and the methods that led to his realization. But that spiritual alchemy, like the alchemy that transmutes base metals into gold, is not so easily discovered. Where did it all begin for him? As it is my self-proclaimed aim to be a seeker of truth, I need firstly to discover the foundations of certainty itself. Human nature in its base condition is one of emptiness and ignorance of the unseen worlds of God. Human beings attain this knowledge through organs of perception. In fact, each of the senses is given to us that we may understand the world of created things. The first thing created in us is the sense of touch. Touch allows us to perceive heat and cold, wet and dry, smooth and rough. But by using touch alone, we are unable to perceive colors and sounds. As far as touch is concerned, these have no reality. <laughs> Next comes the sense of sight. Sight allows us to perceive colors and shapes. Sight is the most far-reaching of all the senses. Then comes hearing, which allows us to hear sounds of various kinds, then taste, and so on, until the senses are all present. When we are about seven years old, a power of discernment is created in us. This new step in our development permits us to understand more than just the world of the senses. At this point, we progress to a further stage. Reason is created in us. We grasp abstract things that are necessary, possible or impossible, 
And this is a perception beyond the reach of the earlier stages. Beyond reason, there lies yet another stage, where a different eye is opened, and we behold the unseen world, what is to be in the future, and other things that lie beyond the reach of reason. مثل اینکه هر چی باشه از حال شما بهتره وقت رسیده توازای محبتی داره تو خوب میدانی هر چی از دست من بر بیاد دریغ نخواهم کرد پسرامو با خودت ببر اونا به سن تکلیف رسیدم من تا قادرم از اونها نگهداری خواهم Let the student be certain that even more is owed to the teacher than to the father. For a teacher is the one who brings him to eternal life, while the father is the cause only of his temporal life. The idea that the father uh, of meaning, which is the teacher, is more important than one's actual biological father it is an old theme and, and Plato has Socrates telling us this in the Republic. What Imam al-Ghazali is, is pointing out here is the idea of the finite and the infinite, the idea of what ultimately comes uh, to naught, what, what is perishing and, and what goes on forever. And so this is the idea of learning those things that one needs for this infinite journey. Because what the Father gives you, he, he gives you life for this worldly journey. But he does not give you the means to get through the world. خدا بیا مرزدش نور چشمان من پدر در لحظات قبل از مرگش شما را به من سپرد که تا آموختن علم راهنماتون باشه اینجا محل مردگان ما باید به سوی زندگی بریم به سوی زندگی joined to seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave and reflecting upon death certainly helps to focus our thoughts on where we're ultimately heading but with the distractions of the world pulling us in so many directions it's easy enough to lose sight of what we should be preparing for what kind of obstacles did Ghazali encounter on his way to spiritual awakening Although our Sufi guardian did his best to honor our father's request to care for my brother and myself, he was unable to do so for long. Soon, therefore, we became students at the madrasa. He and his younger brother Ahmad were left by their father at the care of a friend of his before his death who was himself a faqir, a Sufi. The one thing one reads about is in his early years, 
He was very much devoted to formal studies. The younger brother was always interested in Sufism. And there was an aspect of bookishness about him, you might say, in his early years, which also, of course, made him a very great scholar later on. We had become students for the sake of something else other than God. But he was unwilling that it should be for the sake of anything but himself. know that he was a prodigy. Uh, all the evidence indicates that he memorized the standard text at a very early age and exhausted the intellectual opportunities of his own town in his early teens and then had to head off to the neighboring provincial capital of Nishapur where he sat at the feet of al Juwaini, who was in the eyes of many the leading jurist and also theologian of the day. From an early age, I constantly thirsted after a grasp of things as they really are. For me, this was something instinctive, a part of my God-given nature, a matter of temperament, and not of my choice or contriving. He is a voracious reader, he is somebody who wants to understand everything. He has an insatiable appetite for knowledge. He actually says about Kalam, which is theology, he says that I did not write anything concerning theology until I had memorized 12,000 pages of the great theologians of Islam. Salam Ahmad John. <laughs> he really is uh, taking in this knowledge with a worldview, with a cosmology, based obviously on the Islamic concept of Tawheed, or the ultimate unity of God, and how that uni unity is manifest through diversity in the world. He talks about desiring uh, to get to the root uh, of problems. So... He had literally mastered, uh, memorized, interiorized, and then began to teach uh, these things at a very early age. در خصوص درس از آد خراسانی، بچه‌ها سوالات بسیاری دارند. نظرت چیست؟ The chains of traditional authority and inherited belief ceased to hold me. شما بگو، شما نظرت را بگو. For I could see that Christian children always grew up to be Christians. Jewish children to be Jews, and Muslim children to be Muslims. I also heard the saying related from the Prophet. Every child is born with a sound nature. It is only his parents who make of him a Jew, a Christian, or a Zoroastrian. Ghazali had observed that while certain external factors shaped the different forms that revelation and religious experience could take, at the heart of all of these is the divine existence, and it is in man's nature to seek this reality. When Ghazali speaks about sound nature, that uh, he re referring to the hadith of the Prophet, you know, this word fitra. Could, fitra. Can you explain to me what that, mm. that actually means? Fitra means actually the nature, but uh, as it is the primordial nature of man, is the fitra, man as was created by God. And if you uh, ask what this consists in, one can say in love of God and worship of God, man is created for that. 
Now, the highest worship or the highest form of worship is knowledge of God. And if serving God for humankind means knowing God, then it refers to the intellect God has, God has given man so that he can know him. This knowledge, naturally, is the identification of the known and the knower. One can put it like that. Man is made for this union. And that is what, why I say his primordial nature. By nature, man is a worshiper, just as created by God. Vida. There is a, an inherent nature of God that God has given human beings, and that nature has been imprinted in, in us. And, and, and one of the things about this nature, and I think Imam al-Ghazali's life is a reflection of that, is that there is a gnawing pain in the soul. And it does not go away. And one of the, one of the tragic aspects of, of, of human existence is that when we remove God from our search, which, and whatever we call God, if the Buddhists talk about ultimate reality, ultimate concern, this, this is still coming, approximating our understanding of God. God is ultimate concern. If we remove ultimate concern from our lives, we have to find substitutes. This is human nature. We will find substitutes to fill that hollow space within man because man is essentially a hollow being. So how can we reconcile faith with reason? It's become a luxury to practice religion unquestioningly in the modern world. On the one hand, there is cynicism and no absolutes. On the other hand, rage is mistaken for revelation, and religion in its various persuasions hijacked by radical ideologies, allowing atrocities to be committed in its name. Why is it, how is it, that religion meant to be a means to salvation has become so unappealing? How has the profane become so seductive so that we no longer are aware of the unseen? or are able to accept that there may be a higher purpose to life. This is a tragic condition. The ancients, even in their pursuit of the mundane, always knew that tradition and the pursuit of the sacred were always so much more important. In his search for knowledge, Ghazali traveled to study under the leading theologians of the day. But some of his most important lessons came from quite unexpected sources. چیزینیس <laughs> دانشت پوچ بشه 
In my heart, I knew he had a point. I decided he had been sent by God to teach me. Having experienced a run-in with a band of cutthroat robbers, I resolved to guard myself and the knowledge I had gained against any future encounters. I spent three years committing all the notes I had accumulated to memory, whilst continuing with my studies under the guidance of the learned and venerable Imam al-Haramain al-Juwaini. The world has always been fraught with dangers, and as Ghazali said, you only really possess what you can't lose in a shipwreck. So do we spend our entire lives watching from the shore? Or despite the dangers, venture out in search of a deeper knowledge, one that isn't to be found in books alone? Imam al-Ghazali recognized that there were basically four types of knowledge. The first type of knowledge was sensory knowledge, knowledge of the sensoria, that we, we had this ability to perceive whether it was hot or cold. Uh, we uh, could, could look and see that it was day as opposed to nighttime. But he examined this and recognized that it wasn't true, that a, that a man, a feverish man, uh, would think it was hot when in fact it was cold. We can't deny uh, the knowledge of the senses. But he recognized that the knowledge was not infallible, that the knowledge was something that we could be deluded into thinking, in fact, something, and it was not. Sight is our most powerful sense. But when we look at a sundial, our sight tells us that the shadow on it is standing still. There seems to be no movement. But if we return to the shadow an hour later, then our own eyes will tell us that the shadow has moved. Not by fits and starts, but gradually and steadily, by infinitely small distances, never pausing or resting. The second type of knowledge that he identified was rational knowledge, the mathematical knowledge. And so what he did was he began to examine all of his rational knowledge and he realized, and this is questioning a priori assumptions, which is very interesting, it, it is very modern. What he realized was, is that just as he had discovered that the sensoria were not uh, infallible sources of knowledge, that the intellect could also be in a deluded state, that we could actually think something to be true and have reasoned it out, but in fact it wasn't. And he felt very comfortable with mathematics, which is interesting because the modern world, one of the few areas where the modern world feels comfortable is mathematics. So he felt comfortable with mathematics because he said, whether we're awake or asleep, two plus two will always equal four. <laughs> Certain knowledge must be infallible. This infallibility of a proposition means that no attempt to demonstrate its falsity can create doubt or denial. Now, if someone asserts that three is more than ten, and that to prove it he can turn stones into gold or a stick into a snake, should I believe it? Namaste, <laughs> 
برا 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 میبینی که چی شد آه دیدی حالا چی شد یک مار What if he actually changes the stick into a snake in front of my very own eyes? No doubts about what I know are raised in me because of this. The only thing I am left wondering is how he managed to change a stick into a snake. In our dreams, we are certain that what we see is real. Yet when we awake, we know that what we took to be an unquestionable fact was in fact illusion. So what proof can theology or philosophy give us to guarantee that our senses aren't also deceiving us? Despite all the knowledge I had acquired, I still couldn't resolve this simple and fundamental problem. A battle was raging between my heart and my head, and I eventually became physically ill. It was a bewildering time. The sickness lasted nearly two months, during which time I was, practically speaking, a skeptic, though not in principle or in outward expression. Ghazali did not uh, begin by forcing doubt upon himself. That is, he began to question himself. Now, what certitude do I have about this, about this, about this matter, about this religious right, about this moral injunction? And he didn't on purpose strip himself of all certitude in order to get uh, to complete doubt and then see what happens. It wasn't like that. It was that doubt had been coming to his mind. He began then to question the pseudo-certitudes. He knew that he had to undo himself. He had to reconstitute his being. He had to undergo spiritual transformation. Words would not do. And he had to change his life, his way of thinking. I was willing to sacrifice everything for the sake of certitude. At length, God healed me. I found myself restored to health and balance. Once more, I was able to accept the necessary truths of the intellect as I regained confidence in their certain and reliable character. This did not come about by systematic demonstration or ordered argument, but by a light that God Most High cast into my breast. That light is the key to the greater part of knowledge. Ghazali was able and willing to give something up in order to receive illumination. Ordinary soul does not receive illumination. You have to re you receive illumination only if you are open your heart to God, which means dying to yourself and dying to the world about you. And that's what Ghazali did. It was only through divine grace that Ghazali overcame his bout of skepticism and we too must be open to the possibility of receiving a light of guidance. But with such darkness and confusion confronting us today, is it any wonder that it can be hard to see a way forward? Was the situation any different in Ghazali's lifetime? At the time of Imam al-Ghazali, authority was being questioned. Who has ultimate authority? The religious people did not recognize the secular authority, the, and these religious fanatics begin to kill those who they deem as obstacles in their path uh, to achieving some type of religious sovereignty.
In his time, confusion was reigning. Confusion was, was everywhere. And, and I think most of us would agree in the modern world that we are living in very confusing times, difficult times, uh, times that everything is being questioned. Uh, and, and, and nobody really can see uh, a clear light. And I think that he was in these times. And that's why he's so extraordinary. The political situation in Ghazali's time was in many ways fragile, certainly very complicated. There was a caliph in Baghdad who was a titular ruler of the Sunni Islamic world. Real political power is in the hands of uh, the Seljuks, uh, viziers of whom Nizam al-Mulk was probably the best known example. And it fell to the Seljuks to try and figure out what sort of Islam the state should be patronizing. آن کس که کلمه لا اله الا الله و عیسی رسول الله را از نصرانی می شنود و آن را چون گوینده یا نصرانی است باور نمی دارد و رد می کند کوتاه نظر است اما خطر رد خطری است بسیار بزرگ که از ناحیه کم خردان برمی‌ریزد اینا چنین می پندارند که چون کلمات حق در کتب فلاسفه نوشته شده و با کلام آن در آمیخته شایسته رد و سزاوار کرده است سخنان ایشان را هر چه و از هر که بشنوند چون سابقه معرفت حق در ایشان نیست رد می کنند و با این پندار همه آن سخنان را به خرد نارسای خیش خطا و باطل می انگارند آن کس که نبوت را نپذیرد یقینا کافر است حق با ایشان است هر کس اصول دین را نپذیرد کافر است اگر به این اعتبار کافر است مخالفت با گفته های حق او که به واقع هم حق است روانه خواهد بود یعنی دانش شما به حدی رسیده است که روی حرف علما حرف می زنید غزالی repeatedly makes the point that one of the main veils that keeps people from seeing God is religious fanaticism he says it doesn't matter too much which school of Islamic law you follow there are different theological positions that it's valid to adopt try and be orthodox in fact, it's necessary to be orthodox, but whatever you do, don't turn into some kind of zealot so that religion just becomes a way of feeling that you're better than everybody else and thereby veils you from God. Many have seen Nizam al-Mulk as a kind of Machiavellian figure, patronizing certain forms of religion that he saw as being politically expedient. Certainly his politician's eye seems to have spotted in Ghazali an individual whose program could bring stability and unity to what was at the time a very fractured Islamic social and intellectual reality. I was invited to present myself to the vizier Nizam al-Muk, the powerful chief minister of the Seljuk Sultan, Malik Shah. There I joined his retinue of legal experts and theologians. Abu Hamid Muhammad, Alim al-Jawan, Nidham and Mulk recognizes in him the man who has the power, in a sense, not only to, to give legitimacy to the Islamic tradition as a cohesive tradition that is universal and not as a sectarianism that will splinter into many, many different groups. He gives the basis for accepting state authority, not as some kind of uh, usage of religion as an opiate, but as a recognition that this is in the overriding benefit of the citizens themselves, that anarchy is, is a wretched way to live. As tafakkur, ilm wa taqwa'y shuma bisyar mi guftand, wa man bawar nadashtam, ta khudam, be chashm didam, و بحث های قوی و زیبای شما را شنیدم و یقین حاصل کردم 
ابو حامد محمد من تفکر باز قدرت بیان و استدلال محکم شما را تحسین میکنم سپاس گذارم غربان علاق مندم اندیشه های شما در فضای بازتری منتشر شود این نهایت لطف شماست در فکر بودم و امروز مصمم هستم تا شما را به عنوان مدرس نظامیه بغداد انتخاب و منصوب کنم تا به دانش پژوهان و تشنگان دانستن تفکر و درس وحدت بیاموزید این باعث بسی خوشحالی من از قربان امیدوارم که بتوانم از عهدش برایم مطمئن هستم که از عهده برخواهید آمد متشکرم بابا سپاس گذارم علیه سلام این است که باید اشجه اناس باشد خوب این نکته رو دقت کنید این نکته اعتمادیه شما همه تو بگید ایمان باید اشجه اناس باشه یعنی هیچ کس جداتر از اون در زمان خودش نباشد Theology was the rock and roll of the age, and Ghazali was a superstar, attracting hundreds of students who flocked to hear him expound on theology and jurisprudence. He himself said that a man who is being pursued by a ferocious lion doesn't mind whether it's a stranger or a famous individual who saves him. So why do people seek knowledge from celebrities? And what happens when the celebrity starts to believe his own publicity? There is a lot of evidence to suggest that Ghazali's uh, extraordinarily stellar performance in the universities of his day went somewhat to his head. There he was preaching from the pulpits of the most distinguished, venerated mosques in the Islamic world with all of the great texts of Hellenic and Islamic civilization at his fingertips producing books that already amongst the intelligentsia bestsellers and clearly changing the trajectory of Islamic thought with hundreds and hundreds of the best students anywhere in the Islamic world traveling thousands of miles to sit at his feet. Auzu billah min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Salam wa salatu ala sayyidina wa nabiyina خاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين محمد All the things which I knew were the teachings of God could now be revealed in true form to the students hungry for guidance بار کن این دخمه تراران است بار کن گر همه برف است اگر باران است کم خود کی به خیل و رمه برمیگردیم بار کن جان برادر همه برمیگردیم he was in effect accusing the established leadership of the islamic world of the day of a kind of false consciousness upholding in these marvelous very well funded public debates um, in front of the sultan or whether it be thundering from the pulpits or in retreats of a kind of hypocrisy that they were not practicing what they preached, that uh, for all of their intellectual brilliance, their hearts were, as he says, dark and ruinous. And he saw that as being a fundamental challenge and a threat to the integrity of Islam. He saw it as having dangerous political consequences. He saw it as having consequences for the credibility of mainstream orthodox Islam, as opposed to esoteric or sectarian alternatives. And he also saw it in himself because he was pointing the finger first and foremost at himself and of course his great crisis is precisely about his suspicion that he is not practicing what he preaches. We are living in a time like his time when religion had become stale Religion had become didactic. Religion had become a dry practice of argumentation, dialectic debate uh, amongst students. Imam al-Ghazali, I think, of all of his achievements, and we can see this in his, his own autobiography, one of the things that he really set out to do was end argumentation for argumentation's sake. 
I was distressed by what was going on in the capital of the empire. I decided to speak out, and I condemned the hypocrisy of those surrounding the caliph. I was critical of Islam's religious and political leaders. I was determined to unveil the truth in its entirety. He really recognized the spiritual pathology of the desire of the ego and the self to overcome one's opponent. And he wanted to get back to something much deeper, which is not that I am entrenched in my personal opinion, agenda, political position, and I have no recognition of my opponent, but to recognize that my opponent and myself must together be in search of the truth. And if the two of us are in search of the truth, we can speak. But if we are in search of self-aggrandizement, if we're in search of some ego-stimulating experience of overpowering my debater, then we come to nothing. And because he was a man that could win any debate, he knew how important it was that the ego could not be the object that the ego must be set aside in order for that debate to come to some kind of fruition. سلام علیکم سلام علیکم خاجه از راه دور آمدم آه در بسات ندارم چیزی به من ببخش من اینجا چه دارم به تو ببخشم Kill one man, and you may well terrorize 10,000. But is this what we were created for? While it's unclear who was actually behind the assassination of Ghazali's patron, Nizam al-Mulk, it may have prompted him to begin reevaluating the life he was leading in Baghdad. Muhammad, Bacho, Kojoid. Ghazali had a brother, Ahmad al-Ghazali, who went on to become a major poet and Sufi figure in Persian literature. Uh, the relationship between the two men must have been a complex one. It seems to have been very affectionate, but it's almost certain that Ahmad al-Ghazali, more interested in ecstatic experiences, pouring forth these great torrents of rather Baroque Persian poetry about the love of God, was probably a little bit skeptical about the philosophical and theological activities of his brother. آخر چگونه است؟ مگر بر تو چه گذشته است که جاه و مقام چنین در چشمانت ریشه دوانده؟ مگر از آن چیزی؟ I think what, what's happening to Imam al-Ghazali really is he wanted to be real and I think he recognized how false he was the fact that in, in the West we, we call personality personality which is from the Roman word persona which means mask is already an awareness that, that the personality is, is 
somehow were hiding behind something. And I think what happened was he became aware of his personality. He became aware of this mask, this exterior that he was presenting to the world, uh, which was the, the wonder boy, the genius, uh, the brilliant uh, dialectician. And he's, he's realizing that this can't be me because he's realizing how horrible that, that person is. Despite my success, my wealth and my status, my doubts returned. Not in what I believed, but in the way I was living my life, surrounded by great material wealth. It may well be that the sanctity and spirituality and the effusive quality of Ahmad al-Ghazali's Islam was a kind of counterpoint to the formal book-based systematic theology that al-Ghazali was experiencing and dishing out in the mosques. And it may well be that eventually it was Ahmad's example, somebody who had cracked the problems of the meaning of life through the love of God and experience rather than through logic chopping was the final straw that broke the camel's back and precipitated the crisis. He came to a realization that all of this intellectual knowledge was in fact a very, very well camouflaged ignorance. And because he was ignorant of the most important thing, which was himself. For six months I was constantly tossed between my worldly desires and my longing for eternal life. In the end, the matter stopped being one of choice and became one of compulsion. And this is where the crisis begins. And, and he's, he says he, that one day he would put a step forward and the next day back. And he said, I, ha I have to give up the, all this stuff. I have to find out. I have to set out on this path. And he's feeling the, the time. He's feeling this, this clock, this, this, this clock ticking. He's realizing, I've limited time here. Most of us don't like to think about that the fact that we have no guarantees about tomorrow. He is really at that point where he realizes, I am mortal, I'm going to die, have I prepared for this journey? And, and this is the, the only real crisis that has any meaning for a human being. So he had the truly existential crisis of the human condition, which is our mortality. God caused my tongue to dry up so that I was incapable of lecturing. Each day I'd try hard to teach so as to please my students, but my tongue wouldn't utter a single word, nor could I accomplish anything at all.
a man who has risen to prominence because of his tongue. To have his tongue taken away from him means that his prominence is taken away from him. He has lost everything in his inability to speak. The crisis did not start with a physical illness which would bring depression, you might say modern terminology. It began with a mental intellectual crisis and gradually seeped into a psychological psych or whole psychosomatic reality, into a soul and body, you might say. And it went from up down and uh, gradually began to affect his habit of eating, his appetite, his sleep, and he felt seriously ill. فکر میکنم بیماری قلبی داره ولی به نظر من مشکلش باید مغزی باشه نه مشکل از گردش خونش من که نمیتونم کاری بکنم از دست منم کاری ساخته نیست منم مثل شما کاری از دستم بر نمیاد از هر سه توافق داریم یه جسمی نداره روح و روانش بیماره I examined my motives and realized that my work was not driven by a pure desire for the things of God instead I was motivated by the desire for an influential position and public acclaim I saw for certain that I was on the brink of a crumbling bank of sand and in imminent danger of hell fire unless I undertook to change my way of life. I knew that the Sufi way combines intellectual belief and practical action. The action takes the form of purging the obstacles in the soul and of stripping away its base characteristics and vicious morals so that the heart may achieve freedom from everything that is not God. The intellectual belief was easier, but it became clear to me that what is most distinctive in Sufism cannot be grasped by study alone, but only by immediate experience, by ecstasy, and by a moral transformation. The Sufis were people not of words, but of experience. I had no hope of the next world, unless I could live a God-conscious life and withdraw myself from fruitless desires. Great religious figures transform society as much by who they are as by what they say. And it would be idle to attribute Ghazali's influence simply to the brilliance and clarity of the books that he left behind him. He was revered, it's very clear, as uh, somebody who lived the reality of Islam and of Sufism, of Islamic spirituality, as somebody who was well on his way to being a saint. I have been able to do what my doctors couldn't do cure myself. And yet the cure is absolute. I have to give everything up. My position, my reputation, my home, and my family. 
he performed the act which made Ghazali Ghazali. And that's why we're speaking about him now, 900 years later. That is, he left his position, his wealth, his family, the world, and disappeared. He fled from the whole condition of life which had been so successful, being close to the caliph at the capital of Islam, well off, very famous. He left everything in order to rediscover certitude, in order to be honest with himself and understanding the nature of the divine reality. You understand that I have to go. Where I gave to the poor what wealth I had, keeping only as much as would suffice myself and provide sustenance for my family. And I expected never to return to Baghdad. When you begin the inner journey within your soul, it's very good to also begin an outer journey in the world out there. It's not at all like modern tourism, in which you travel on the surface of your soul, no matter wherever you go, you come back the same imperfect person after having spent $10,000 and ruined the climate and the environment. It's not like that at all. But when, when one travels with consciousness, one realizes that one's home is not that particular street, one's place is that particular place, it's in God. A real traveling spiritually means that. And so traveling outwardly was considered to be a very good support for the traveling inwardly. What is it about that road to Damascus and sainthood Assalamu alaikum, alaikum. After his crisis, Ghazali needed to become a stranger to the circles of princes and scholars where he had made his name. Dissolving his ties and placing himself in the crucible of asceticism, he began living as an anonymous wayfarer, trusting only in God. Publicly, I announced that I had resolved to set out on a pilgrimage to Mecca. But privately, I made arrangements to journey to Syria. I took this precaution out of fear that the Caliph and my colleagues would oppose my decision. Al Ghazali spends the best part of ten years incognito. We don't quite know what his itinerary might have been. He probably performed the Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca a year after disappearing from Baghdad. We know that he spent some time in Jerusalem and indeed wrote one of his key theological treatises in Jerusalem. We know also that he spent quite a bit of time in retreat in a cell in Damascus whose location is still known and pointed out and indeed visited to this day. But it's very likely that he was following in the footsteps of many of the earlier Sufi saints of Islam who had decided simply to sever, temporarily, their worldly attachments and to find God in the wilderness, travelling through deserts and forests and mountainous regions, uh, trusting in God to provide for them and constantly trying to bear him in mind, contemplating the beauties of God's creation, attempting to recall God through the recitation of the Quran, through the canonical prayers, through a lot of fasting, through meeting remarkable men, 
sages and saints who often lived for a while in the wilderness and accepted disciples. I devoted myself to purifying my soul, improving my character, and cleansing my heart in the constant remembrance of God, putting into practice what I had learned from my study of mysticism. The fact that it started upon the spiritual life means that it was initiated and that what his spiritual practices were, were without doubt the vocation of various names of God, the standard practices of Sufism, the purification of the heart, of the soul, meditation. The Sufi path uh, consists of certain practices, ways of thinking, ways of acting, and above all, ways of being. The Sufi path is a journey from the human state to the divine proximity. I stayed in Damascus for two years, doing nothing except cultivating obscurity and solitude, together with religious and ascetic exercises. I would go into retreat in the Umayyad mosque, going up the minaret of the mosque for the whole day and shutting myself in so as to be alone. One of the things about the mystic path or about uh, this direct experience of reality is that for Imam al-Ghazali, it is science. Because at the root of science, and this was well known in the Muslim world during his lifetime, which came much later from the Muslims to the West, at the root of science is the ability to replicate the experiment. If the experiment can be replicated, then we can get scientific results. He wanted to find out does this indeed, these experiences that, that others have claimed, if I set out on this path, and he was an experimental scientist, if I ex set out on this path, can I replicate that journey? And he did it. And that's how he came to a certainty of it. We don't know whether it was his intention at the outset to return to civilization. He probably didn't know. All he knew when he left Baghdad was that his spiritual circuits had fused. He had to get out. He had to try and find an answer to his crisis in his heart and in the recollection of God. During these times of solitude, there were revealed to me things innumerable and unfathomable. This much, I shall say so that others may be helped. I learnt with certainty that it is above all the Sufis who walk on the road of God. Their life is the best life. Their method, the soundest method. Their character, the purest character. It is in the practice of dhikr, or remembrance, that God is said to be mysteriously present in His name, and by this constant recollection, we are able to draw nearer to the divine. This is the philosopher's stone with which Ghazali sought to purify his heart and transform himself. And it is this that I need to know more about. I'm doing this research on Ghazali, and I, I know that he spent years wandering. Yes. And presumably he was engaged in various spiritual practices. Could you tell us something about about these and what the nature of them is. In Sufism, much emphasis is laid on the invocation of God. Not only in Sufism, in the Holy Quran, there are many 
many verses in the Quran about remembering God. Religion itself is based on the remembrance of God. The more one mentions God and invokes God, the more the name becomes actualized in him. I mean, the very religious rites and practices are based on divine invocation. One can say that the gist, the foundation of all religious practices and the surest way and the nearest shortcut I mean, we have shortcuts to weigh God, but the nearest shortcut to God is, is invocation. Al-Ghazali eventually does go back to the great metropolitan cities of Islam and the whole point of his story for Muslims is precisely that he returns to orthodoxy but with a new vision. His vision is that the proof of Islam is an experience, what he calls dhalq, tasting the realities that lie behind the veils of physical existence. That's the real argument for religion, and that doesn't come about through the systematic discussion of metaphysics. It comes about through remembering God, purifying the intention, purifying the heart, and trying to open oneself up to an effusion from above. The afterlife approaches, and this world passes by. The journey is long but the provisions are scant, and the danger is great. Having set out on this journey to discover more about Ghazali and to dispel some of my own doubts, I've come to realize that the certainty of knowledge lies in the tasting. And while not achieving Ghazali certainty, at least I am beginning to understand what I need for this path. As time passed, various matters, together with the entreaties of my family, drew me back to my homeland. And so I returned to it again, though at one time, nothing had seemed less likely. Theologians, philosophers and students of religion continued to beat a path to my door. I did not know what I still had to offer, but I tried to do what I could. دوشنبه چهارده جمادی الاخر سال 505 هجری قمری برادرم ابو حامد محمد بیدار شد 
سهر نمازش را خواند و آماده رفتن به سوی پروردگار شد از من کفنش را خواست آوردم Say to my friends when they look on me dead, weeping for me and mourning me in sorrow, do not believe that this corpse you see is myself. In the name of God, I tell you it is not I. I am a spirit, and this is nothing but flesh. It was my abode and my garment for a time. What I am now, Even so shall you be, for I know that you are even as I am. The souls of all humankind come forth from God. The bodies of all are compounded alike, good and evil, alike it was ours. I give you a message of good cheer. May God's peace and joy forevermore.